Hello and welcome to DNA Today. I'm your host, Kira Deneen. DNA Today informs on what's happening in the genetic world, shows packed news stories, lessons, all to keep you updated and educated on the ever-changing world of genetics because it's constantly changing. You can tune in every Monday at 11.30 a.m. to hear me live on whus.org or on the radio, 91.7 FM. And today, I'm talking about a woman who had a significant impact on everyone in the world. Believe it or not, everyone in the world because everyone has been affected by different treatments and cures, uh, all coming from cells from one woman named Henrietta Lacks. And you've probably heard her name before, and if you were listening to the radio about two minutes ago, I just played a PSA that talked about the event that happened on Thursday. And I was able to attend the event, and there was a lot of people there. Jorgensen was very full, and there was excitement in the crowd. It was it was a really great event, and I'm going to go through what happened during the event, and I was also able to interview descendants of Henrietta Lacks. So that's going to be at the end of the show um, where I talked to one of her granddaughters and one of her great-granddaughters um, about the cells, about the impact these cells had, um, about the recent news story about um, a Tennessee mother who thinks that it's the book, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, is not appropriate for high school students. So we kind of covered a lot in our interview but that's at the end of the show, and right now I'm going to talk about the event. So it happened on Thursday, September 24th, 2015, from nine, to, uh, sorry, from seven to nine thirty, and UConn was hosting this free event honoring Henrietta Lacks. And the best-selling author of the book, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, Rebecca Sloot, was present as well as members of the Lacks family. And just a little background on Rebecca Sloot: she's the author of the number one New York Times bestseller, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, and she's been featured on numerous television shows, CBS. Sunday Morning, the Colbert Report, Fox Business News, lots of others. The Mortal Life was chosen as a best book of 2010 by more than 60 media outlets, including Entertainment Weekly, USA Today, O, oh, The Oprah Magazine, Los Angeles Times, National Public Radio, People Magazine. I could go on and on. Uh, it was named the best book of 2010 and one of the best 100 books to read in a lifetime by Amazon.com. So if I haven't already stressed it enough, it's an amazing book. I definitely recommend reading it. Um, I'm covering just the tip of everything that's covered in the book as well as what the event talked about, which there was overlap, obviously. But it's, it's a phenomenal book, and um, quite a few classes here at UConn uh, require the book um, for reading for the classes, and it really touches upon so many different themes, and it's not just science. You don't need to be uh, a science person to read it. Um, there's really appeal for general audiences. So the book explores issues in bioethics through the story of Henrietta Lacks. So it kind of takes you through um, her life as well as her descendants and weaves in what's happening with science um, through this time period. And Henrietta Lacks' HeLa cells became the first and most commonly used human cell line, which have generated breakthroughs in cell biology, drug discovery, and understanding of human diseases, among many other things. The book also tells the story of the collision between ethics, race, and medicine, of scientific discovery, and of a daughter consumed with questions about a mother she never knew. And, and this um, daughter is Deb, and she had kind of a, an interesting relationship with the author, Rebecca, who was able to um, kind of explore and explore her mother's history and learn more about her because a lot of people really didn't know much about her, including her own family. So this book kind of takes you through the adventure of them learning about um, all these different things, and it was a full decade that they spent doing this. So it's really um, quite an amazing experience to be able to read this and see kind of where they started and kind of where they ended up. So the story is central to emerging issues on ethics of genomics, personalized medicine, which we talk about a lot, and it's really becoming um, more in the mainstream um, media of personalized medicine. You even see commercials on TV now for it. Um, it kind of brings up the issues of who owns our cells, what is responsible use of genetic information, how can our genetic privacy be safeguarded in an era of personalized genomics. And together, Rebecca Sklut and the Lax family provided the most important contemporary um, story on the use of human cells in biological research and the numerous ethical issues that are raised by the story of Henrietta Lacks because there was lack of consent of her cells being taken from her that she didn't even know what was happening. Um, and consent wasn't really a topic back then. It wasn't something that people talked about a lot. And now it's really, uh, really focused on. And this event was great because it really provided a unique opportunity for students and community members to engage um, with the ethics of personalized medicine. Um, and this is a topic that's bolstered by the International Recognized Research Excellence in Personalized Genomics at UConn Stores, 
um, Jackson Laboratories, and Yukon Health Center. So these are uh, kind of three main um, kind of institutions that I've talked about a lot, obviously being here at Yukon. But um, it's it really important issues that they, um, they bring up. And following the presentation, there was a book signing. Um, and peep, if you waited long enough, uh, there were uh, the opportunity to take pictures with uh, Rebecca Sklute and the Lax family, which is pretty cool. And to kick off the event, Dr. Lucerin presented on health disparities, discussing how access to health care is a critical problem and that discrimination is one of the main barriers. So he talked a lot about that and really referenced a lot of different resources and data that kind of just showed the audience how much of an issue it really is and kind of posing the question of how we're going to address this and how we're going to make it better in the future. He also gave an overview of the fame of HeLa cells. So HeLa cells really... If you talk to anybody in science, they know what HeLa cells are, and they probably have some in their lab. They most definitely have them in their lab, actually. And 74,000 publications have cited HeLa cells. In the last 10 years, a majority of Nobel, P or Nobel Prizes um, have used HeLa cells um, in their work and in their research. So he kind of just opened up the presentation, but Rebecca Sklute was kind of the main part of the presentation. And she talked a lot about Henry Lack's history because the um, event was really focused on Henrietta Lacks as a person as opposed to just the cells, but kind of looking at her as a person, um, all the impacts that her cells have had on really the human race. And in 1951, she was diagnosed at John Hopkins, which was the only black hospital in the area, so she didn't have a choice where she wanted to go. She died the same year at the age of 31 of cervical cancer. And she was in this public ward, which was for black people and poor people, and most of all these people could not afford to pay their bills. So oftentimes doctors use them as research to kind of compensate for them not paying because they figure, all right, well, if you're not paying, then I might as well get something out of this. So they would use them um, as research kind of rats almost, like lab rats, which is just, it's, it's terrible to think about that they did this without consent, without telling them anything what they were doing. And so... Henrietta's doctor, again, without telling her, cut a piece of her tumor and gave it to Dr. Guy. And at this point, researchers were trying to grow human cells outside the body. And so far, they had had no success. It was very challenging because cells can be very temperamental and they have to have the kind of perfect environment in order to proliferate and grow and, and uh, divide and have lots of them. And this was until Henrietta's cells were cultured. This, her cells were the first ones that were able to be cultured because they were tough and they'd grown environments where other cells would just die. So if the, the cells weren't doing quite as well, they are like, oh, okay, these environment for these cells aren't great. How about we do this? And then it would, it would proliferate even better. And they're like, all right, that's better for cells. So they really were able to figure out what the best um, conditions were for cells and in, a Q &A, in the Q&A session at the end of the event, Rebecca Sklute said that when I asked um, kind of what do you think the biggest impact HeLa cells have had um, in the world, she said this of just figuring out how to culture cells because that's kind of step one. If you can't culture cells, you can't do a lot of the research that people, um, that researchers have been doing in order to come up with treatments and cures. And it's really, really that base. And so kind of a background on how cell division works is that cells usually stop dividing around 50 rounds. So they've divided 50 times and then they start dying. But HeLa cells were different. They just kept going and they still are going. So these cells were um, collected in 1951. And today in 2015, they're still proliferating, which is, is kind of mind blowing. And um, there's people make the joke that uh, technically she has um, kind of mastered like reproduction because she has her cells all over the globe. And uh, it's kind of cool to think that she kind of has this immortal life going on. And so when these cells just kept replicating, Dr. Guy realized that the significance of these cells were enormous and he started sharing them with his peers. And if his peers, this was like a little interesting tidbit that if his peers were kind of an airplane ride away, someone from his lab would bring a vial of the cells to the airport with some growth media in there. And they'd find a pilot or flight attendant going on a plane to that city and say, hey, can you put this in your pocket and uh, give it to someone on the other end? And very different. You could not get away with that today with security. But back then, security was much different and a little bit looser. So you kind of could get away with that. But just to picture how many cells that these HeLa cells have grown to, 
Um, it got to the point that 6 million cells are being produced a week, and this is probably even more by now, but 6 million cells a week being produced. And if we were able to weigh how many cells have ever been grown, it'd weigh around 50 million metric tons. 50 million metric tons. So we're talking about a lot of cells here. So I've mentioned them having a these HeLa cells having a big impact on treatment um, and cures and healthcare and vaccines. So which ones am I talking about? I'm only going to name a couple because there's so many, but some major ones um, that were mentioned during the presentation as well was polio vaccine, in vitro fertilization, and um, Rebecca Sklut made the point that a lot of people in the crowd were probably born from in vitro fertilization without HeLa cells um, that may not be available now. Maybe in the future it would have, but um, it probably wouldn't be available now to us. HPV vaccine, cloning, mapping genes, and even going to space. Um, HeLa cells were sent out to space to see how human cells would react to zero gravity. And it was really uh, interesting to hear Rebecca say that um, there's not a person out there that has not benefited from these cells. And this is kind of how I opened the show. But I really want to stress that point that so many different um, vaccines, treatments, cures, that s I'm sure someone in your life has been affected by that and by them being affected, you're affected or you've been directly affected, that these cells are just so kind of powerful. So that happened all in the 1950s of um, realizing that these cells were great to culture and starting to share them. So if we fast forward to 1970, this is when scientists wanted to learn even more about Henrietta's genetics instead of just the cells. So they went to her kids for blood samples, and the doctors called Henrietta Lack's husband, David, or Day, as most called him, to ask for permission. So I want to kind of dive into this a little bit, because historical context is key. At this time, the Tuskegee uh, studies had hit the media months before, and a little background on what these studies were. This study took place in 1930, but had not been discovered by the press until four decades later. So now it happened in the 1930s, but it hit the press in 1970s. So the study monitored black males who had syphilis to see how their health declined, and then many eventually died from this. And they did this while having a cure for the disease. So they just watched them die when they had the means to treat them. And rumors say that some were injected with syphilis. This has never been documented, but either way, they're still viewing men that have this deadly disease and not treating them when they had all of the um, means to do so. And um, these black men were offered incentives, and they were uneducated and poor, and they didn't know how to ask the right questions. They didn't know what they were getting themselves into. And you know, these researchers really took advantage of them. And the reaction of the black community now in the 1970s was to think they could not trust doctors. And this is kind of, um, you know, reasonable kind of thinking because of everything that had come out of this. They really didn't know who to trust. So knowing this, after, a few months after this had hit the media of the Tuskegee studies, Day, Henrietta's husband, was hesitant and scared to work with these, like, white doctors. There was a lot of miscommunication surrounding what the blood was being taken for, and doctors thought they were being clear in expressing the blood was being used for research, while the family thought they were being tested, and they kept waiting for results and never received any. So this, this miscommunication was in part due to doctors not explaining what the blood was for, but also that Henrietta's husband, Day, had a fourth grade reading level, and they really didn't take the time to explain things to him that he was not able to understand what they were saying and to comprehend scientific terms. And this is kind of an issue still today that doctors don't explain things to lay people that they kind of just assume they know things or don't take the time to do so. Um, and this is um, kind of a big topic that Rebecca took the opportunity in her presentation to stress the importance of this communication in science with the public. And she was um, encouraging students to explore the field of scientific writing, especially women, because there's not as many women represented in scientific writing. And then she talked more about this in the Q&A session, saying that we need more scientific translation. It's, it's vital in order to have everyone understand what's happening and have patients understand their treatment and their, their, um, their health, really. And if a patient speaks another language, a translator is provided. However, there's no translation of doctors' language of science a lot of the time. So doctors need to be, become better communicators with patients. 
and jobs such as genetic counselors should be utilized more um, to be the liaison between these professionals and lay people because doctors often don't have time to explain these terms to people, but there needs to be some way for patients to understand what is really happening and to see that they understand it and are comprehending it and repeat it back to someone and be like, all right, so this is what you're talking about. Another major point Rebecca made was how devoted Henrietta's daughter, Deb, who I mentioned before, was to teach people about Henrietta and to learn for herself who she was. Because Deb was very, very young when her mother died and wasn't able to have any memories of her. And so she was really focused on learning about her and learning kind of who she was. And Rebecca worked closely with Deb for, like I said before, 10 years to unravel this mystery of her mother. And Deb was very fixated on sharing with the world what she learned so that her mother's life did not go undocumented, that people knew the woman behind the cells. And at first, um, Deb was hesitant to work with Rebecca on the book because she wasn't sure if she could trust her as a previous kind of reporter tried to con Deb into giving them her mother's medical records so that um, they had their hands on them as a lot of different researchers wanted these medical records. But in the end, Rebecca and Deb formed this relationship and Deb, or sorry, Rebecca ended up creating what Deb wanted, what she um, quoted Deb saying she wanted, quote, a story about much more than the cells. And Rebecca herself became interested in Henrietta Lacks when she was in high school. She was not a great student in high school and was retaking her bio course at a local community college, and her professor wrote the words H-E-L-A on the board and explained how these cells came from a woman's tumor and she was black. But that was the only information he provided. So after class, she asked him more about this mysterious woman, but he didn't know much else. Really, no one did. So this was a moment that inspired Rebecca to begin her decade-long exploration to find out just who this woman was and this journey didn't start right away because she was in high school at this point and she started this after college. But it was really, she talked a lot about how one moment can really inspire you and um, stressing to students that, you know, that can happen. And to teachers, that uh, for teachers, they may not know that, um, you know, one thing they say could inspire someone's rest of their career. So the Lax family had a presentation um, bit after Rebecca. And it was Kimberly Lax and Veronica Spencer, who are descendants of Henrietta Lax. And they shared a lot of stories of the family and different events and honors they've received throughout the world. And one particularly interesting story was how an artist from London came to the Lax family to create portraits of the Lax family members. And um, as I said earlier, I was able to interview both of them and discuss um, these portraits, among other aspects of the event, and Henrietta um, Lax, their grandmother. So I'm here with one of Henrietta Lacks' um, relatives, and so can you fill our listeners in on how you're related to Henrietta Lacks? Yes. Uh, first and foremost, my name is Kimberly Lacks, and I am the granddaughter of Henrietta Lacks. My father is the middle son of Henrietta Lacks, and his name is David Sonny Lacks, for those of you that have read the book. Great, and thank you so much for being on the program. Really appreciate it. Um, first question I wanted to ask is how HeLa cells have helped so many different people in so many different ways of treatments and cures for different conditions. And are there certain ones that you have seen that you're more proud of than others? Are there certain personal stories that you've heard from people? Well, like, uh, I couldn't put my hand or just say one um, because I've had people from all over the United States uh, come up to me uh, with tears in their eyes thanking me because they have a child because of the in vitro fertilization medication that they took and that was because of my grandmother's cells or that their child's cancer is in remission because of the medication that they're child took that my grandmother helped create. So I couldn't really put my hand on or just state one aspect of what um, what she's done because it's just too many to name. It's too many to name. It's, it certainly is, and it's all throughout the world that labs all over the place have HeLa cells, that it's really it's a standard thing. You say HeLa yes. cells, people know what you're talking about. Exactly. I was told by a scientist um, that if you was to go into any hospital or any laboratory anywhere in the world, it's guaranteed that they will have vials of my grandmother's cells in it. 
freezer. Even the, the lab that I work in here at UConn has yes. HeLa cells, and I saw them in the freezer, and I was like, I was like, that's and so cool. You, I know. You know. It's incredible, right? I mean, and not just the United States. I mean, the world. Even in London, we had a young lady that came out to meet the family, and she basically wanted to do our family story in oil paintings and she did that and it's incredible and now those pictures are hanging in the science museum in London so that's one place that the family is definitely looking forward to going to but again she has impacted everyone all over the world. So how do you feel about your family having such a big impact on educating people about genetics and genomics? You're here at UConn today for this event of educating people. Where do you see yourself in, in this role, and like, how do you feel about the impact you're making? Uh, I, I feel it's incredible because I look at these universities and colleges that we attend, and I know that these students are the future. And I'm hoping the same way as in Rebecca's story, for those of you that may know it, when she was in high school, her teacher wrote H-E-L-A on the board. And she never forgot that, and she kept that in the back of her brains. And once she started attending college, she went forth with gathering that information. And maybe it's something somewhere that someone, one of our family members or something that I may say that may strike something in someone at one of these places that we attend. And inspire more research and more innovation towards this and using HALA cells to do it. Exactly, exactly. So recently, talking about um, like student education, a lot of um, high schools are reading this book, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. And, but in Tennessee, there's one parent that's been very outspoken about this and saying that it's inappropriate. So I want to hear your thoughts on this and what age range you think is appropriate to read the book. Well, me, myself, um, I believe the student was 14, 13. Definitely high 14. school age, yeah. And with... Things that are going on nowadays with the internet and social media and the things that are on television, I think you should really start speaking with your kids early on. I mean, really, as soon as they're able to talk and comprehend, you should be teaching them so that they don't hear it out in the streets or from other people. Now, as far as this lady in Tennessee is concerned, I think... She took one word or one sentence from that book and tried to make it more than what it actually was. She formed her own opinion on just that sentence because it's so many more, so many different aspects and things you can talk about that can come from that book. And for her to just take that one sentence and try and create this band, as she called, on the book... I think it's a little bit too late on that, <laughs> but I mean, to each his own, everybody's not going to agree, everybody's not going to accept how you feel, she has her opinion, same as I have my opinion, but that's how I feel about the story. Now, uh, Veronica may feel differently, because um, she had also mentioned this to me, because I had not heard about this. And she was the one who had actually informed us, so she might want to elaborate. You know, Veronica, why don't I get your um, say on this? And, and first, you can say how you're related to Henrietta Lacks, because that's how I started. Hi, I'm Veronica Spencer. I am the great-granddaughter of Henrietta Lacks. Great. And so um, adding on to this discussion of students reading this book in high school, what are your thoughts on this? Do you think that it shouldn't be a banned book? I mean, that seems a little over the top. I definitely feel like the book shouldn't be banned. I feel like the mom from Tennessee, while, her, while she had good intentions, she definitely missed the beat of what this book embodies. And... Um, from what I understand, the child was in high school, and at that age, you should have already began talking to your child or children about their bodies, how it worked in self-assessment. The part that she had a problem with was where my grandmother was in the bathroom, and she wasn't you know, being inappropriate with herself, but she was doing self-assessment, which is why the rates are so high for people um, having critical illnesses versus things that could be detected early because a lot of people aren't doing self-assessment. And, you know, it's 
so many teenagers are having babies now. The rates has definitely skyrocketed. So I was trying to figure out where this mom was coming from. But with the rates of teenage pregnancies being so high now, I think, you know, it's time to talk to your kids about those things to avoid certain STDs and things of that nature, as well as, um, I'm going to say that, you know, not she should have talked to the child about their body, but definitely self-assessment. It's just so much more that we can touch on a topic in which she called pornographic. That was very extreme statement. Would very, you agree with that? It was very extreme for someone simply assessing themselves. It, and if they're my, medically doing an examination on themselves, yeah. as we all should. And I mean, at some point when you go see a primary care physician, they teach you how to, yeah. as a woman, how to detect if you have lumps in your breast to know if you may have breast cancer. And a lot of times they teach this in school, so it should reinforce the point in the book. Absolutely. And without that being reinforced and the fact that this mom had a issue with my grandmother's self-assessment, it shows that Rebecca book opens up great arguments and debates on things like what what we should do on a typical basis, not just about the scientific part, but about being human, human and the things that we do for ourselves and how we care for ourselves and how we, you know, respond to things that are happening with us because something that seems so minor could become major. And without self-assessment, my grandmother would have never known that that lump was there. Right, and so... With that, she really was able to discover that and go into the hospital because she found that. And if it wasn't for self-assessment, she wouldn't have gone in. Yes. And without that particular part, at first when I read the book and I was like, oh, Rebecca. Like, because when we go into our bathroom, we think privacy. We think, you know, we're trying to be alone. We close that door for a reason. And Rebecca opened the door to the world. And I was like, oh, this may be a little too much. But then as I thought about it, you know, the mom was just looking at her like, oh, she's in the bathroom and she touched herself. But it was wasn't like that she was self-assessing and I don't I my big message to children is it's okay to know your body because who else is going to tell your parent or your guardians what's going on with you you have to tell them mom I I might feel a lump in my breast or you know I've had this throbbing pain in my knee for a certain period of time so how could you tell your child that that's not something that you should do and refer caring for yourself as pornographic and it should be a standard thing that people should be okay with saying yes I do self assessments and that's kind of something standard in healthcare you mentioned privacy um, that kind of made me think of kind of everything that you've gone through um, just your family do you feel sometimes like you don't have privacy because you're so much in the spotlight with these things and that you have your family's history kind of in this book? Um, well, we still have our privacy, but the book do open up our family and it puts our family on Main Street as maybe, um, a, like, I'm not sure how to say it, but I'm our family's on Main Street, and we're definitely a figure for health care advocacy and science and what her, Rebecca's book embodies, everything that the Lex family is about. We're about self-assessment. We're about, we are a typical family. We're about science moving forward and advancing science, you know, and that's what people can relate to. And that's why the book for Rebecca is so successful because she put things into the book that she knew people could relate to. Definitely. Well, thank you so much. Is there anything that you want to add to um, say to, you know, UConn students that are listening or other people that may be listening? Well, if the UConn students or anyone's listening, I would say, you know, if you have children, talk to your children about their bodies. Um, HPV is one of the shots that a lot of children get, and it's more positive and it's it's more effective if you the child gets it before sex. And you should definitely talk to your child about self-assessment so they can feel more openly coming to you about sex in their bodies. Um, it's nothing wrong with it. And a lot of people put shame on things like that. And when you shame a child from being so open about things like that, then 
that child don't respond to the prompt as well. I just feel like this mom might have missed the beat on the birds and the yeah. bees. <laughs> Every child needs to have that conversation with their parent, definitely. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for coming on the program. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having us.